Welcome to the Digital Enterprise Society podcast, addressing all aspects of the digital enterprise, inspiring connection without boundaries and creation without limits. Thank you for tuning in. Here are your hosts, Tom Singer and Craig Brown. Hey, and welcome to, or welcome back to, the Digital Enterprise Society podcast. Thank you for choosing this podcast because let's face it, there's like 2 million shows out there in podcast land and you have decided to spend the next half hour with us at the Digital Enterprise Society. And we appreciate that because this podcast has been designed to be a resource for those who work in and around PLM. The Digital Enterprise Society, it is a forum for the exchange of ideas surrounding the tools, processes, and practices used across the product lifecycle. To learn more, visit digitalenterprisesociety.org. My name is Tom Singer, and I have the honor to co-host this show every week with Craig Brown. As you know, Craig is an industry veteran and former PLM leader at General Motors. Hey, Craig. Hey, Tom. Good to hear your voice. Well, I'm looking forward to round two. I, you know, Mark has chosen a topic that <clears throat> is near and dear to my heart in so many ways, mostly heartburn. But anyways, let's, let's, let's go. Let's see, let's get on with this. These digital battles are fun. We have Craig on one side and Mark Pendergrass on the other talking about issues that matter to all of you out there in the world of PLM. Because every single week we try to bring to this podcast interesting ideas that are going to help all of our listeners enhance and grow their careers. And this is the second in our series of the digital battle. And today we have the topic of customize your PLM or adapt to it. And on the one side, we have Mark Pendergrast. He is the trustee for content at the Digital Enterprise Society. And on the other side, we have Craig Brown, who is our own co-host of the Digital Enterprise Society podcast. They're both engaged, they're both experienced, and they both have opinions. So, <laughs> yes, they do. So, to kick this off, hey, we'll start with you, Mark. Mark, why is this issue of customization even an issue? Well, I think this is an issue because it involves money, and it involves money over time, and it involves people's satisfaction with systems. So, you're trying to make an economic decision about things that people hold very near and dear to their hearts. And that, of course, is always a uh, opportunity for controversy. And I think uh, it, it's something where we're all being pushed to become world-class manufacturers. Deadlines are shortening. Quality expectations are getting higher. Delivery has got to be right on. And the tools that we have today to execute PLM just aren't quite where they need to be, and they need a little bit of help to get them to the point where they can achieve all our targets. And the question is, how do you get there? All right, Craig, why is this even an issue? I think it's largely because organizations just don't know how to embrace something they don't create. And, and it, you know, it's interesting because if you go high enough in a corporation, what you find out is, you know, we, we don't want to invest the resources, mostly people, in customizing. We, we've done that for a long time. Instead, why don't we take the best practice from another industry and just use it? You know, a lot of the startup companies, whether you talk about a, a Tesla or you talk about, um, oh, there's a bunch of electric truck people now. You know, there are too many to list. But they have a huge benefit over an existing company. They just buy the tools off the shelf adapt to them and use them. And I think companies, especially, they're underestimating how they're going to get nailed by a startup just because the startup doesn't bother customizing tools. They just use them. So I think the tools actually have gotten good enough that you can do some really cool engineering and not customize tools at all. All right, so we want to start this battle. Let's start the battle with why customize? Mark? Okay, well, this is, this is my wheelhouse here, so I, I will go. What we find is if you want to become a lean manufacturer, if you want to compete at a world-class level, you have to do two things. You have to be absolutely excellent and you have to pursue low-cost labor. And when you put those two together, it's a re recipe for total disaster because a new startup, as Craig mentioned, you're hiring the best of the best. You've got fine minds. They know exactly what they're doing and they tend not to make mistakes. But as you become an established industry, you're going to go find people in 
offshore locations. They may only have a couple of years of experience and they don't have the deep engineering knowledge to not make simple mistakes. And so I think you have to come in and give them some help. And I would love it if the current tools on the market could give them that help, but they just can't. I agree with Craig. We're a little bit past the raw Tinker Toy Toolkit stage, but we're not to the place where ERP is right now, where you could literally plug it in and use it. And it tells you when you're making mistakes and it tells you when you're doing things wrong or you're behind. PLM just isn't there yet. I'd like to think in my lifetime they will get there, but they're not. And I think that's really the crux of the issue is how do you take people that aren't these startup, highly motivated, 80-hour-a-week guys and have them be successful in a highly competitive world? So, so Craig, you're, so you're, Mark, Craig, you're, you're saying your counterpoint. That, that the customization. Oh, I'm sorry, Tom. No, I said, Craig, your counterpoint. Well, I, I, your, your premise is you've got to customize to, uh, well, I won't mix words to make it idiot proof, right? For the, for the, the less motivated workforce. And, and I, I, you know, I don't think that tools are that sharp. They're not like scalpels or, or instruments that a surgeon would use an expert would use a, guy that works 80 hours a week. Those are your, your words. On the other hand, um, you know, maybe, maybe part of the problem is, you know, the tool companies, solution providers, a lot of us call them, are really good at saying all the cool things they can do, and yet they leave all kinds of warts around in their tools. And I think some of those warts, in fact, I would agree with you, they do lead to mistakes when people don't use them well. And so, um, maybe we were talking about adopting or adapting. Maybe the real issue is training and understanding. And, and oh, by the way, if the tools aren't robust, well, that's a whole different problem. And, and that could be another reason for customization that I would have to end up agreeing, even though I don't like it. Um, so I, I don't know. I, 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 uh, this search for labor, let me pick on that for a second. The low cost labor. Well, where has that gotten us? There's a lot of dysfunction going on in our society because we did just that. And, and I, I think um, maybe that's another wave for PLM is, is to make people that are maybe in a higher cost labor market so effective that their product is still more cost effective than, than searching out, you know, pieces from around the globe. And, uh, you know, the pandemic, if nothing else taught us how susceptible our supply chains are to, globalization of moving work. So maybe this is a great opportunity to go back to just adapt, just adopt the tools because, you know, this, this other stuff about customizing for maybe a lower capable workforce is, ah, I don't know. I think that's a weak argument. So that's my two cents. So if you're going to customize, what's the sweet spot? There isn't one. It costs too much. If Even if you get it done right now and it sort of helps with the workforce thing, we we're just debating, um, the, the real problem is the life cycle cost a generation later. So let's say a decade in a generation of, of tooling. And, and I know Mark's been through three of them, I think, um, <clears throat> uh, a couple of which I was involved with, but, but my point is, okay, so you do it and you're fast and you're better quality at that new plant two years down the road, eight years down the road, the people that made those customizations, well, they're like, Mark, they've retired. And, or, or me too, for that matter. And, and there's nobody around to maintain them. The next generation sits there and goes, I don't know how it works. And I, 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 guys, I dealt with this. I, I, I sat my IT people down. I said, Hey, how's this really interesting, complicated thing work? It was custom tool, by the way. And, and they're like, we have no idea. I said, well, then how are you going to figure it out? It was like dealing with a frog on a dissection plate when you're in high school, right? What did you do? You you stimulated it with electric current to see which muscle move. You've got to be kidding me. This is what you got to do to, to, to maintain software is experiment with it. So we don't know how to maintain it. So another big reason not to customize is we don't appreciate the life cycle cost and we don't keep the workforce around to keep it working. They retire. Mark and I retired. So there you go. Don't customize because you, you won't find somebody to replace us. Ah, so So the answer is, because we have bad management that can't yes, manage right. their business, <laughs> that we can't customize. Well, that okay. same bad management moved to lower cost labor, but never mind. Let's not go there. <laughs> okay. Well, I, I think 
I think you're missing the boat, Craig. I think. All right. Let the the problem. One of the big problems about this discussion is the fact that because it happens in an IT environment, people seem to lose their minds and they can't think straight. So I'm going to take you back to my history and say, let's move this problem to the factory floor where I used to work and and gained a lot of my gut feel for things. I'm sitting on the factory floor and I buy this brand new shiny assembly line that builds product. And I go get my nice low cost laborers and I put them on the line and I run it for a couple of days and I notice that it's creating defects out the back end. And so I go back and I yell at my people, don't make those defects. That's bad. And I do that every day for about two weeks, but the defects keep rolling off the other end of the line. And I'm noticing that it's taken a lot more people than I thought it was going to because the uh, the assembly process didn't get designed quite right. And so I'm a manager of that plant. And what do I do? do? I say, well, I'll just have to adapt to bad quality and bad productivity because, you know, that's the way it came. And I, I don't want to risk the fact that I'll have a life cycle cost if I change that assembly line. So out on the floor, we say, I don't care what it takes to get good parts out at a reasonable rate. I'm going to do it and I will eat that cost. And I make a cost benefit analysis of owning these customizations for the rest of my life or this well, who, tooling. Who, who, whose life? The life of the tool, the life of the manager, the, the life, life of the, of the person making the change? Oh, hmm. Okay. <laughs> Every piece of equipment on the floor had the design package for the machine stuffed in the cabinet. Every machine was tweaked to make it run just perfectly. And that was a big cost because you had to go into the prints for every machine to try and figure out how it was working. But every one hit every lick as you're customizing each machine. And this wasn't software customization. This was literally rewiring the machine, changing its tooling to make it function correctly. And I knew I had to live with that for the life of the machine. And I had 24 totally different machines, but each one ran perfectly. And I was willing to eat that cost because the cost benefit was very, very obvious to me. Mm -hmm. It was good parts versus bad parts. When you go back to the IT realm, and I think, Craig, you've hit on this several times, it's hard to measure what you're getting back for that customization. So you tend to discount that value, and all you see is the cost. Well, yeah, you know, so maybe to be fair to our audience, is some of this the business we came from, the various places in the the automobile business? Because you're right, getting getting the number of units out the plant that's the desired build schedule so you can go feed up an assembly plant who in turn can go sell product to customer, which is how we all get paid. You, you know, that's a, that is a big deal in especially mass production companies. So consumer product goods and automobiles. And right now in the news, you can, you can read about all the disruption and it, it wasn't a, a plant's lack of customization like you're summarizing Mark. It was in fact, a supply chain, it was well oiled and well spread out around the world. And then it got disrupted by the pandemic. And then by a certain key part that happens to be in the devices we're all using to do this podcast. And, and, and you got a, you got a perfect, well, actually you got a, three or four perfect storms lining up on top of each other. So, so I get your point that whatever machines you have and wherever they're located, you got to get them running and get production out. You know, there, there's even at that place we worked in central Indiana, there's an IC foundry there that's in mothballs. Maybe somebody should bring it out of mothballs. I'm just joking. Uh, but, but on a serious point, yeah, you, you, you will do what necessary to either get the machine line running. What, what I'm worried about in general, though, with, with PLM is there, a lot of them don't have manufacturing background. They, they just are stubborn because they learned Excel or they learned uh, some other tool and they, they want the modern PLM system to be like that tool. And so they, they, they are in, you know, manager positions, maybe, maybe director positions. Oh, yeah. And they just, they just want it to work the same way because they know how to, to manage that. I, That's I why they to want look, it to work the same way. I want it to look like the mainframe. 
because that's what I grew up with, right? Yeah. Come on, <laughs> so, man. <laughs> yeah. If, so, the 30 year olds listening to us are going to say, you got to be kidding me. I'll, I'll, I'll take Craig's solution. I'll, I'll just buy it off the shelf and use it. But, yeah, but, no, but to, to your point, we, the floor and the rate, the run at rate, if the commercial solutions cannot run at rate, in other words, number of, of work, well, let's call them work tickets for lack of a better thing, per unit time, per the operators you have, then you're right. You got to find a different solution, either a different vendor, you, you know, solution well, providers even, uh, and this kind of happened as we were ending our careers, but, but this whole fourth generation language thing, you know, for the Siemens solution, that's this thing I call Mendex. Maybe that's part of the answer. It's not customization. It's just, hyper configuration, but, well, and, but they limit said, the configuration to be things that you can do like link, Lincoln logs or Lego blocks, plug and play. Right. Well, and as long as that meets your needs, I would highly recommend it. You know, we're talking about where that sweet spot is, oh. but again, if you are shipping things to the floor and they routinely can't build them, you got to do something. You can't just say, well, I'll yell at the engineer on the manufacturing floor. We gave up on that in the eighties. We just yeah. kind of said, you know, this is stupid. I can yell at these people all day and nothing changes. I need structural change. And in the PLM world, if your people are releasing things with unqualified parts, if your guys are releasing things with incomplete bombs, if you guys are releasing things that changed but aren't on the change, you can't just let that go. And the only answer we have today is throw an army of low-cost people looking at it with a big checklist, or you write a customization that doesn't let them do it in the first place or catches it as you're flying out the door. And that so, sweet spot is basically where you're catching enough defects that you're running at the level you want to run at, and it's not costing you an arm and a leg. So so do you have that problem that, that I was alluding to where those customizations, the if you will, the, the work instructions that, that help the operator improve their throughput. Uh, is that maintainable by the, the next guy, the next person who takes over the enhancement of checklists? You know, they have IT well, skills, but they also have engineering skills. I mean, it, now, is that getting better? I mean, I would hope so if you're going to do that a lot. Well, now you're getting into my sweet spot, which is architecture. Oh. Most people who do customizations are terrible architects. <laughs> They're coders or engineers. And you know how it is on a product line. You've got a guy who's an architect who sees everything in the car and how it's going to work together. Will you take a guy who's a fender guy and let him start changing everything? He's going to break something. And he's going to make it impossible for that car to ever get built. You so, need somebody to look at the overall and find a non-invasive, least impact way of achieving the end. And that was something I was very, very good at in my career. And we had some very easily maintained customizations because I tried not to be invasive. But if you got a guy who's just going in and he's brute forcing it and saying, well, oh, look, I can change this hunk of source code which is, you know, the worst thing you can do, then you've got something that's unmaintainable. Or if you're a guy who's kind of a programmer and learned basic because it ran his tester or something like that, and he writes this spaghetti code nightmare that does some nice stuff, but it's completely impossible to understand. That's where you get in trouble. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm having vivid memories in my 20s about, having to maintain somebody else's tool code. It, these, these were all tools, but uh, it was exactly that, a combination of spaghetti code. And, and you know, when, when we introduced um, a more modern language for software that controlled the vehicles, it was amazing how many people continue to argue that they wanted to use the thing before a modern language, which was assembly code. Yep. <clears throat> and so um, it is a rate problem, just like we've been talking about, and and yet there were classes of problems we could eliminate by using that better language than, you know, raw assembly code. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine doing assembly code today with all the microprocessors, all the different kinds of things? Um, I can't even imagine doing some of the languages we've used in the past couple of decades. Right? You, you need something at this higher level that I, I do agree with your point about architects. And, and I think, you know, 
I think it's way misunderstood, right? That if you're going to craft a cathedral, you still need an architect to, yeah. to make sure the loads can be managed, right? That the building right. doesn't fall down. It, it's, um, you know, I'm thinking about the Notre Dame and the terrible fire, but it is amazing that it lasted several hundred years before those oak timbers dried out to the point they caught on fire. But <clears throat> anyways, so, so what, well, let, let I, get, I think what you're the describing can I do oh, the other half of this one? Yeah. So now we were talking about architecture on the customer side, but I got to put the ball back in the court of the vendors. Their architectures mm. are terrible. Their architectures <laughs> aren't set up to be changed. And How do you think that happened? <laughs> well, some of them have architectures that are holdovers from the Cold War days. <laughs> And I think and that, to use our cathedral example, that's okay. As long as the timbers don't catch on fire. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> no. So they have bad upgrade practices. So they do things that break customizations. They go, they seem to go out of their way to do that sometimes. And they do this by deprecating functions that everybody uses. Mm-hmm. And they do this by changing their underlying object model so that something that you kind of latched on to extended, they extend in a different direction and break everything. Well, you, you know, there's the, one of the famous uh, solution providers, we won't name names on this show, is notorious for not even thinking about an upgrade path. They just say that's the price of innovation in the tools and new ways of doing engineering and product development, we, we won't even make the guarantee about that. You'll just have to work through, we'll help you work through the process of embracing the next generation um, data model and the, and the, and the, the implication of the breaking your stuff, right? It's right. really so interesting they, when you get into an argument with such a company about that, who's going to pay, right? Who's going to pay for the upgrade? Um, which, you know, I, I think all of us, at least big companies, we would demand that the upgrade be reasonable, Maybe not free, but certainly reasonable, right? Yeah, but again, they're, they have pushed their lack of architecture thinking back onto you to deal with this kind of random drunken walk of, of upgrades to their tool that you can't predict. So, so I, I, which I raises it. your cost, which makes but, you want to adapt rather than customize. But they're not evil. At least I don't think they're evil. So why did they have a broken architecture? What, what's your analysis of that? I have an answer to that, but I want you to go first. <laughs> well, that's an interesting question. I think part of it is at the end of the day, all of them are still CAD heads. <laughs> oh, I'm going to have they, to agree with that, they, but keep they, going. <laughs> they, they see PLM is just a bit, you know, they all started with little work group data managers, right? They kind of grew into PDMs, they kind of grew into PLMs, but at their core, they still see it as a place to put CAD data. And you know what? That's the part that never breaks. It's workflows, it's rules, it's all these other objects that break. Because they don't ever think about them because they're CAD heads. Interesting point. Okay, I, I want to add to that. I think part of what makes it so hard to keep this architecture stable and moving in a consistent direction like a ship in the ocean, right? I think, I think a part of it is us. We, the big customers, we, at least the ones that spend a lot of money, we're so demanding when we get into a, a procurement cycle and we basically say, your argument, I need these changes or else I'm not going to buy your tool. And, and the people involved in making the deal, they, they, they blink, to be blunt. Okay. And so, so we are part of the problem. And, and you know, one of the things that I, I learned late in my career is I, I talked to other big industrial companies. I, we would have this exact debate that you and I are having today. What's the sweet point? You know, um, do you do you configure everything out the wazoo? This is part of why I think the Mendix thing from Siemens is where it is, is because how do you satisfy that demanding customer and at the same time don't fracture your architecture? Your example about workflows is perfect. Um, you know, and and how do you manage all that? Well, okay, so we'll ex- I'll accept that you need some configuration. The the other principle I would drive and I would try to get the management culture to embrace is. 
you know, if you're demanding customizations, so the way you talked about them to keep the line running, right? You ought to be asking yourself why it is you're, you're having that problem when your competitor across town is not. And so what I'm getting at is what's your competitive advantage. And that's the only place you should do customization. If you're doing customization to fix things that are broken, you know, you need to go back and read the gold rat book and some other things we've talked about on the podcast about, you know, theory of constraints and what's your real business. And if everything's a constraint, you don't know your business. So, so I would also say management's got to know the, the constraint and they got to optimize for the constraint. If you don't know what that means, go read theory of constraints and, and then focus on the only customization And I would try really hard to make it a configuration so that it's easier to maintain that you allow is something that's on your critical path. And oh, by the way, if your critical path changes, like the whole thing happening with electric vehicles and getting rid of internal combustion engines. Okay, cool. The the constraint change, go right back to your PLM tools and all the rest of them and say, okay, where's the constraint? Let's work on that. All right. As we wrap up this battle, I'm going to give you each about 30 seconds. My last question so, Mark, we'll start. We'll start with you. Is customization is it worth the cost? Can you afford it? And then, any last word you have about this battle? Okay, I think you have to afford customization. The world is too demanding to let garbage get out of your PLM system because that just drives garbage into the plant. The trick is do good investment analysis. Is this a good investment or is this stupid? And then track the performance of that customization over time. As you then see every year, year over year, you're saving two man hours a week and that equals X. And my next upgrade, I'm going to spend 20 hours. Does that pay back or not? So I think the battle was a good one. Uh, I'm glad Craig and I actually battled this time instead of, uh, (laughs) Having a love fest. I was going to say, you, uh, battle, battle one, you agreed a lot. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I think this is this is how people learn. People, man, here, here's my last thought. Man has been customizing his environment for tens of thousands of years. We're going to stop that because some software vendor says his architecture can't support it. Yeah, of course All right. not. All right, Craig, same question for you. Customization, can you afford it? And any last words about the battle? You can't afford it. It takes too long. Um, you, you may be better in the short term because you can, you know, in, in quality management systems, you talk about uh, uh, corrective action and immediate corrective action to keep the plant going. And then you talk about the preventative action. What makes the long-term effect? And I think in the preventative action world, you really need to partner with your solution vendor or vendors if you got a couple, and you just need to teach them. This is why this is a big deal on my plant floor and why I can't have your PLM system producing garbage. You know, and then work with them. Not, you know, don't threaten them necessarily, but literally work with them so that you can keep using a commercial off-the-shelf tool and only configure stuff when it's your your constraint, that last point I made, only there. That's the only one you can afford when you look through the whole life cycle. And I'm talking about decades, not not three years or keep the plant running. Well, Mark Pendergrast and Craig Brown, thank you for being here on the Digital Enterprise Society podcast for the Digital Battle Round 2. I'm looking forward to Round 3, and I know so is all of our audience. Hey, and for everybody, make sure that you check out what the Digital Enterprise Society has coming up on June 17th They have a webinar that you're not going to want to miss. You're certainly going to want to be there for this one. And you can sign up at digitalenterprisesociety.org. It is the future of configuration management uh, with Scott Wartell. So make sure that you check that out and come back here every single week where we're going to have more thoughts, ideas, and information in and around product lifecycle management. The Digital Enterprise Society, it is the place for the exchange of ideas around digital manufacturing tools. Go check us out right now at digitalenterprisesociety.org. You've been listening to the Digital Enterprise Society podcast. Learn more about what you've heard here today at digitalenterprisesociety.org. Join us again next week for more connection without boundaries and creation without limits.